Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Breer, and welcome to episode 28 of the 11FS Fintech Insider Breakfast Show, brought to you this morning by our good friends over at MyTech, who provide tomorrow's identity verification for today's uncertainty and uncertainty we really, really have at this stage, don't we? In this show, we're bringing you the best and the brightest from around the fintech and banking landscape every single weekday, straight into your homes at 8.30 BST. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Jane Ann Gardia, who is is former CEO of Virgin Money, uh, Salesforce Ventures, all different types of stuff, and now a founder of a really, really, really exciting uh, startup uh, called Snoop. Uh, I think you're the, the founder and executive chair over there, Jane. I'm not really sure how you fit all of these things in, but thank you so much for joining us this morning. How are you doing? Thanks a lot, David. Great to see you. Yeah, doing really well in the sunshine. So looking forward to having a good chat with you. Sounds good. Today, what we're going to be doing is talking about Jane Ann's new startup money app, uh, how our relationship with money is is evolving. And particularly, I think, in these uncertain times, I mean, as always, drop questions over on LinkedIn. If there's anything you guys want to uh, throw into the mix for conversation, do and we'll sort of weave it in as we go. Uh, but Jane Ann, tell us a little bit about your background, because uh, I mean, I, I should say Dame Jane Ann, shouldn't I, so to, to be uh, be more more proper? But you've had such an a, an amazing an amazing career, an amazing background. Give us a little bit of a, a an overview. Gosh, well, thanks very much for that. I'm definitely just Jane Ann. Thank you very much, David. Um, well, I started off in Norwich, um, qualified as an accountant, and found myself at. Uh, Norwich Union, which is now uh, Aviva, and absolutely loved it there and realised that actually the thing that I enjoyed was meeting lots of different people and uh, working in different parts of the business. And that really uh, sort of started my career off. I had lots of opportunities there to go into finance and marketing and, um, you know, other areas of the business. And then Norwich Union got itself into um, trouble and I was asked to project manage that uh, a solution to that and realised that I could do some project management, got the show back on the road. And uh, then I was looking for something new to do. And I met a friend who uh, knew Richard Branson and he introduced me to Richard Branson. Richard was looking to set up in financial services at that point. And I was able to introduce Virgin and Norwich Union together and we created the thing that became Virgin Money. And I guess even though that was nearly, oh gosh, that was 25 years ago now, at the time, and this sounds terrible, you know, the internet didn't exist and we felt very high tech because we were uh, the, only the second company ever to launch financial services over the telephone. Direct Line had got there first in, uh, with car insurance. So we tried to be the first in terms of using technology and using new ways of communicating with customers with simple products delivered to their homes in a way that would suit them. And I guess, you know, as a consequence of that, we've been looking to new technology that makes life simple for everybody because we all want simplicity in our lives, but delivering the important product that's financial services. And I think that, uh, you know, throughout my career, that's the thing that I've really tried to do. And Snoop's the latest example of that. Excellent. I mean, uh, you've got to be careful who your friends introduce you to at that stage, I guess. I mean, I, <laughs> clearly, clearly I've got the wrong friends. I need them to introduce me to Richard Branson, essentially, at this stage. But that's, a, that's a, an amazing uh, change there. And and as you say, uh, I mean, we were sort of talking about this before we went live, but uh, you've spent a lot of time in Norwich. I'm sat in a very uh, rainy, dreary Norwich right now, unfortunately. But uh, it's amazing the the sort of community and connectivity that sort of comes from that, isn't it? Really, really good. I mean, I have to say, I think that Norwich is its fascinating to find so many uh, people that create innovative businesses. I mean, of course, we're all over the country, but th th it is interesting how much does come uh, through Norwich. And I remember, again, many years ago, talking to somebody that was very senior at Norwich Union and him saying that, uh, you know, there's a character in East Anglia, which is about, you know, being able to create something, protect it and grow it. Um, and uh, And I've very much seen that over the years, for sure. How are you finding these times? Obviously, uh, with everything that's happening with Corona, uh, you know, travel and uh, is is completely off the agenda. You know, everybody is fully working from home now. Um, how have you found sort of moving to that uh, full time at home uh, vibe? I mean, I think it's really interesting. And first of all, you know, I, as again we discussed before we went on air, I think there's um, many of us who are the lucky ones that are able to work from home and. Uh, move relatively seamlessly into this sort of environment we must remember that not everybody can do that but what I think has been really helpful and inspiring about the last few weeks has been that we have proven haven't we that 
not only does the technology exist for us to be able to operate like this and stay in touch with each other in a really positive human way, but I think um, that means that um, we've learned how to use the technology in a way that we wouldn't have contemplated uh, previously. You know, I've heard lots of organisations say, we planned to do this over the course of the next several years, and look, we've done it over a few days. Uh, and so, you know, a bit like all crises, I guess, it's forced us, I think, to use the tools that are at our disposal to carry on living our lives. And I think that will change the future, future of everything, really, but certainly the future of work. And one of the things I'm really excited about is that, um, you know, I did a piece of work into why there is a disparity around gender in a lot of businesses in uh, the UK at the moment. And back in 2015, lots of people, women in particular, were saying, why can't we use technology to work from home? Not too much had happened in order to change that. And now it's all happened. So I hope that, as I say, there'll be lots of positive coming out of the way in which we can communicate together by using this brilliant technology. Fingers crossed. Yeah, there's, like you say, there are, there's going to be some definite upsides there, isn't there? Like a lot of the excuses that people have used to not do those things uh, to now have melted away when we're seeing people be really, really productive wherever they need to be. I think the other thing on that as well, as you, as, as you say, is people are really fitting work around life, you know, because we've got no choice, have we? We've got uh, kids are not in schools and everything's happening and the world is continuing isn't it the business world is is moving forward as as well as it can do so I completely agree hopefully uh hopefully more of those excuses uh melt away over the next uh next couple of months and uh that that will be the benefit of this but loads and loads of people um jumping on uh from again from around the world which is fantastic so uh good morning Jan great to see you morning Katie how are you doing Getting a lot of people from Norwich this morning as well, Jane Ann. I'm not sure if it's uh, it's like the cumulative Norwich effect of myself and you uh, getting people mm -hmm. jumping in here. Good morning, J uh, Nigel Walsh. How's it going? Um, if you guys have got any questions as we go through, feel free to for, to drop them in. But uh, thank you so much for joining this morning. So, so Jane Ann, tell us a little bit about Snoop. Um, it's a really really interesting concept and a, actually a really interesting balance, as you as you said, between human side of things and the technology side but for anybody who doesn't know snoop can you give us a bit of an overview sure so um snoop is on your side snoop is snooping for you rather than the big businesses snooping on us as consumers if you like and what snoop this little robot friend is um going to do is to use the data that you give us uh, access to to identify where you can save money or where you're being ripped off and making sure that you're not being ripped off and making sure that you've got the best possible deal. So putting that in a, a, a more sort of technical uh, way. Well, perhaps I'll tell you the story really of where the idea came from. So um, I, I'd been running Virgin Money for a number of years before it was bought by the Clydesdale Bank uh, back in 2018. And at Virgin Money, we'd uh, been building our own digital bank to compete with the likes of Monzo and Starling. And of course, when Clydesdale bought it, they had their own digital capability. And so the digital team were at, at original Virgin Money were made redundant. And we all got together one morning and um, the guy said to me, well, look, why don't we set up our own digital bank? You know, it's the way of the future. And I have um, a friend and colleague who I've worked with for many years, Dave Dyer, who's been my um, finance director for all that time, and who went, I am not getting involved with another bank. Uh, and we all looked at him and thought, you know what, he's right. There's all sorts of issues around banking that we can now move away from. Um, but given our experience, what can we do then to bring the best of banking to consumers? And at that point, um, the regulators, brilliantly, I think, you know, there's, there's been so much push by um, regulations throughout Europe and particularly in the UK to stop the dominance of the big banks. That's why challenger banks have been encouraged. It hasn't quite worked. You know, the big banks still have 90 odd percent of our bank accounts. So um, they created this environment called open banking. And what that means is that the banks are required to make banking data for customers available to authorised organisations such that those organisations can use your data from the banks, but on your behalf rather than it being something that the banks use for their benefit. So we became um, regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority to be one of the organisations that can, with a consumer's permission, look at your banking data, whether it's with RBS, Santander, Virgin Money or whoever, 
and use that data, use AI to look at what you're paying regularly, um, work out whether or not you could be paying less, whether you're operating through the best possible providers, working out when your insurance company, for example, comes up for renewal and making sure that you're ready for that and able to get the best deal. And looking at, as I say, where you may have been ripped off. So I remember one of the examples that one of the team identified was that he'd set up a Sky subscription, which he thought was £18 a month. Um, there was obviously some small print that meant it could go up after a certain amount of months had passed. And we were able to identify that. And he was paying 80 quid a month. But of course, he hadn't looked at his bank account quickly enough or, you know, in, in enough detail to identify that that had happened. And he was horrified, rang Sky, and they reverted to his original rate. And, you know, we were able to save him as a consequence over £60 a month. So what this really does is it's, um, as I say, Snoop's a robot, he's on your side, he's using your data for your benefit entirely anonymously, entirely confidentially. And we reckon that we can save the average UK household about, 1500 quid a year as a result of that so um, wow. it's it's great i mean it's it's interesting isn't it i mean particularly uh, as you say sort of post crisis the the fca and the bank of england have done a, a lot to sort of change the landscape haven't they and you know move it away from just those gigantic towers controlling what consumers can do um but I guess in, in this instance what, what you're doing is I mean po post 2008 I guess trust has been the major issue really hasn't it with big organizations of have not been, I don't think consumers, I mean, consumers trust banks not to run away with all their money, but they don't trust them to do the right thing for them, do they? So actually having somebody sitting in between those things to ensure that you're always on the best deal, you're always moving forwards. I think that's such a, uh, such a great thing because that trusted center party uh, can really save people, as you say, a, a lot of money. And I mean, in these uh, these times then uh, literally every penny counts doesn't it in terms of uh, uh, the savings that can be made but um, I like I read that you've you've launched I mean this this very rarely happens but you've launched a month earlier than you were originally planning to do is that is that just showing off if, if you got is your engineering <laughs> team so good they like nailed it a month early and put it live or or they is there something brilliant. more to it <laughs> Well, the team are brilliant, obviously, uh, and I, they'd all want me to say that, and they really are. But but the way that it worked was that um, we'd set up Snoop in beta um, form back in January, and we'd ask people that were interested to come and join us and help us to develop Snoop and make sure that it worked for them. And it was very successful. You know, we had 5,000 beta users in a very short time period. And so um, we were listening to their feedback and we were able to identify that actually very quickly that Snoop technically was working exactly as we wanted it to work. It was robust and uh, that was super important, of course. And so actually, when we talk about going live, what we really mean is progressing that beta um, unit into the App Store and into Google Play. Um, and um, we knew that we'd had you know, robust testing, lots of um, comments from, as I say, over 5,000 people. So it was ready to go when we were ready to go. And so when the crisis happened, we felt, well, let's bring it forward because this is something that can save people money. Um, but what we'd also found during the beta period was that um, I've talked a lot about the AI, if you like, that analyzes customers' data, but we're also using human intelligence. And um, what we're saying to people is if you find a snoop that's in your area that you want to share with fellow snoopers that's going to save them money or stop them getting ripped off or help their lives, then share it through this platform. And what a number of the beta users were doing as we went into this crisis was saying, I found, I found ways in which I can help people to homeschool their child or think about, for example, one of the big ones, for example, was that we um, discovered that Morrisons were offering a discount to NHS workers. Mm. One of our snoopers uh, identified that and we were able to share it with the people on our platform that work for the NHS and they were delighted. So our, uh, our provocation to go live early, if you like, was the fact that these beta consumers were saying to us, this is a platform where we can share, we, the people, <laughs> can share with each other as well as you, Snoop, um, analyzing our data to make sure that we can live a bit better lives through this mm. difficult time and that was the reason no that's great i mean like i say community in, in these things is uh, such a big part of it isn't it so if people can can contribute to not only how they manage their finances but actually the benefit that that can bring to the the sort of broader community that's a it, it gives it such a, a great momentum in that as well doesn't it so um, yeah, I, I, I think recently, go on sorry, sorry I, 
so I think it just changes the power, if you like. You know, we're so used to the big companies being in control of our lives, and this is giving us, the consumer, the opportunity to challenge that. Yeah. I mean, it's no no mean feat sort of launching a new a new product in the market during a, a global pandemic, but how, how's that been? How's the, how's the reaction been so far? I mean, we're, uh, we are delighted. I mean, you know, you'd expect me to say that, but it's genuinely the case. So as I say, we had 5,000 beta users during the first three months of the year. We put the, um, the, the product live uh, in the app store and immediately the thing that's very um, notable for us, noticeable mm. for us, is that the engagement from people is very high. So, you know, a very about uh, more than 75% of our customers are using Snoop at least three times a week. And they're on the site for between one and three minutes at a time. And I think, you know, as we all know, as we use apps, that, that's quite a significant um, piece of engagement from our customers. So, you know, we're, we're, we're encouraging people to share it, obviously, by um, through the through word of mouth, uh, because people can save money that way, and you know it's free to use. Um, from a, the way in which we earn our revenue, there's there's two ways at the moment that we're earning revenue. If customers switch to a provider, we do to a different provider, we do get um, a payment from the the new provider. But we would never suggest that anybody switches because of the commission payment that we receive. Obviously, as you say, trust is so important; it has to be right for the customer first or you know, it's certainly not right for Snoop. Um, and then we're going to be asking in a few weeks' time um, people if they've saved a lot of money to think about tipping Snoop because at the end of the day we have got to, you know, f get some money in order to be able to continue to use the platform. But, you know, we're not going to be charging a fee and, you know, this is a free thing to use that should save customers, as I say, certainly hundreds if not more than a thousand pound a year each. Yeah. Well, I mean, at, at that stage as well, I think if you're – uh, you know, so many business cases for products are set up uh, almost as sort of punitive charges, aren't they? But if you're if you're really driving benefit for consumers, then actually, I'm I'm sure people wouldn't mind you uh, sort of uh, benefiting from that benefit essentially. So it's a it's a great way of going about doing it. What um I mean, people's lives are probably changing quite dramatically during this period of time. So savings actually is probably something that, in many instances, I mean, I was again joking with you beforehand, not on greater trains and getting into from Norwich every day is uh, certainly saving me some sanity and saving me some money at the same time. But I guess in the, these times, then things are getting tighter and tighter and tighter, aren't they? So like say that that amount of money saving over the course of the uh, even a short period of time would really sort of adds up to, to people's lives, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, financial management during this period is really important, isn't it? We don't know how long it's going to go on for. But I think as well, people are going to be thinking about how they spend their money going forward. I, I saw somebody um, tweeting uh, this morning that she had say she reckoned she was going to save about £400 a month simply because she was in lockdown, you know, not going to buy a coffee or go out for lunch or whatever it happened to be. Um, and I think thinking about how you spend that money more um, effectively going forward is really important. Um, particularly as we don't know, as I say, how we're going to come out of this economically. So we would always, as bankers and, you know, people that have been in this in industry for such a long time, be suggesting that at this moment of crisis, it's time that people really think about how they can eke out their money further. And there are a number of ways and Snoop will help with a lot of them. Excellent. I mean, it's a, a, a fantastic thing for you to have, uh, have started and got involved in as well. I mean, how have you seen the balance between, it's very different startup life to big corporate life. How have you found the sort of straddling of those two things? Well, I think that um, because I worked for Virgin for such a long time, uh, it hasn't been quite as dramatic a change as you might imply. Mm -hmm. You know, Virgin continues to have an entrepreneurial culture and, you know, we set up Virgin Money from scratch and there are a number of other uh, Virgin businesses that we as a team have set up from scratch, whether that was some people, particularly in Norwich, will remember the Virgin One account, which was built there. And subsequently um, from Scotland, actually, we built Virgin Money Giving. Um, so there's a number of new businesses that we've uh, breathed some life into. And of course, that's one of the things that's really been great is being able to bring together largely the teams that have done that over the past. You know, we're a bunch of people that have worked together over a number of years. And, and I think that's helped us too in being able to launch from lockdown. You know, I think that we talked about how important it is for tech 
to continue to use this sort of um, on-screen technology during this period. But I think at Snoop, we've benefited from the fact that we're a team of people that have worked you know, face to face for a number of years. And so it's not that difficult to revert to seeing each other on, on online. Um, it doesn't feel like we need to be together because we know each other very well. Um, and uh, that entrepreneurial spirit has always kept us going. And I think, I think it's really important in all businesses to keep on challenging, keep on changing, keep on listening to the customer and keep on trying to do some good. And that might sound a little bit sort of worthy. But, um, you know, over many, many years at Virgin Money, we had a corporate ambition, which was to make everyone better off. And um, we were quite alone in all of that. And when I look back at Virgin Money, I do think it was the thing that made us successful. Um, and I do think that coming out of this crisis, it's the organizations that look after their customers that are the ones that are going to be remembered in the future, not the ones that are trying to um, either take advantage of the situation. And in fairness, I don't think there are many of those about, but you know, organizations that are putting themselves first, I think aren't going to get thanks. And one of the things we're trying to do with Snoop is, as we were always trying to do with Snoop, is make it completely consumer focused because it is about the consumer first and foremost and, uh, you know, and about trust. And then we all um, thrive together. The business will be successful. The consumer will be successful. And hopefully we can create something better that way. I completely agree with that. I think, as you say, the if, you, if an organization has that purpose, uh, it yeah. defines their culture. Uh, and actually, I think the the urgency around a, a, a purpose, actually, like you say, is the thing that really galvanizes everybody together, isn't it? So, and, and exactly as you say, I mean, Virgin, uh, the, the word entrepreneur springs to mind immediately, doesn't it? So actually the the transition probably and the, the work ethic on that side of things is, is probably very, very similar. So, uh, I mean, you're um, really well known in the the, 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 the banking sphere. And obviously, I mean, the, the fintech and banking landscape is so intertwined now with the regulation and everything that's going on. I mean, how, how do you see the, the world sort of moving forward from here? Because as, as you say, the while the, the I mean, I know uh, Anna Wallace watches this show from the FCA a lot and who's led a lot of the, uh, the innovate side of things over, over at the FCA, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount that has been done. But as you say, 90% of, of customers are still with the big banks. Do you see, is that, are we at sort of a point in the cycle and that will change over time? Or do you think actually more significant action needs to be taken to to really create competition in a, in a much broader way? That was a big um, question well, to end on, it, wasn't it? It's it, uh, it, it, it a big question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that we are seeing change. And, and to your point, you know, the regulators and the world, um, particularly in the UK, have tried to create additional competition ever since the, the last financial crisis. So, and, and you know, that's been very real. I've experienced the, the regulators being, you know, they, they have competition objectives to ensure that there is more access to broader banking products and broader banks um, for consumers. But the big banks have continued to be dominant. Um, and I think that's largely because, you know, customer apathy and because, um, you know, that banking is pretty boring normally, isn't it? And thank goodness for that. But it doesn't force customers to think, oh, well, you know what? How exciting I'm going to change my bank today. Uh, and I think that's right. Banking shouldn't be exciting. It should be stable and sensible. And, you know, we should be very confident that those institutions are looking after our money. But that shouldn't mean that we haven't got the opportunity to spend better. And, you know, I think, by the way, that all of the, all of the banks are determined to look after their customers well. Um, but of course, they have had access to our data in a very closed way for a very long period of time. And I think this ability to share data now in a sensible, controlled and well-regulated way is going to make a big difference. You know, we Snoop won't be the only um, business, of course, that uses that data through open banking to customers' benefits. And that's something to be really um, applauded, I think. Mm. I think that... Um, you know, I do think that going forward, there'll be an interesting, as you point out, an interesting balance between fin and tech. Um, I think that the big banks have um, often been very, of course, very much um, focused on the fin side of things. I think their investment in new tech is critical for them to survive and thrive going forward. And I do think the smaller fintechs have been much more focused on tech than fin. And I don't think that they will survive if they don't understand banking. So I think bringing those together and really making sure that financial products are delivered through stable organizations that have access to great technology for the benefit of the consumer is where we will be going 
quickly and um, successfully in the future. Great. Uh, I mean, I, I again, I really align to that. I think the, the world is moving to services and actually services like Snoop that sit across these things. I mean, gone are the days where you would go to a, you know, a, what bank A's financial advisor and just believe that they're giving you the best advice rather than an independent. Whereas actually from Snoop's perspective, sitting across the industry, giving advice across the industry rather than just the products that you have. I mean, I, I've kind of seen many organizations in the past, you know, a, a decision tree tool that whatever route you go to ends up being a product from, from them, you know. So actually being in a situation where you've got that full market view to sort of give advice and it's based on your actual data, you know, it's not a hypothetical situation, but it's based on your transactional information. That is, a, again, a really, really powerful thing to to help people very specifically. I mean, it feels like um, this isn't a uh, this isn't really a generational thing at that stage. Um, I mean, we've talked about open banking a lot uh, in the past couple of weeks on on the show, and I think at the point where open banking, I mean, you've mentioned open banking so little in this, which I think is the best thing because it's actually about the use case that you're using and the benefit you're driving to the business. Uh, to the individuals rather, uh, rather than the technology that is actually being deployed into it. So, I mean, this feels like it's not, my mum would benefit from this as much as I would, is really probably the, the shorter version of saying it. So do, do you sort of see the, the types of demographic that this is applicable to very, very broad? Oh yeah, very, very broad. It's about, because it's about our personal lives, I think that's the point. You know, the data is us really, isn't it? It's what we spend on, what our preferences are, you know, what we need to do in order to make our lives work. And that whether you're, you know, young or old, that that's very relevant. Uh, I'm going to sound a bit like a geeky banker and make the point that Snoop won't give financial advice in a regulatory sense of the word. What we will do is we, we look at what you spend at the moment and then look at, you know, if you've got a mortgage, is there a mortgage out there that might be cheaper for you? We're not always saying this is definitely the best one for you. We're just saying it's better than the one you've got, if you see what I mean. Uh, and hopefully that can be helpful for people. But um, And the reason for that is, as you say, it's a platform that goes across banks. And the reason that I think that the banks themselves probably won't do this and can't do this is it's so hard to imagine that Bank A is likely to recommend that a customer goes to Bank B's product. Uh, you know, I've never seen that happen. And as you say, you know, partly in the past, that's because all roads have led back to the bank that you first started with. And what Snoop enables is, as I say, for you to look at, well, given where I'm starting from, just show me something better. And that's in a whole market context, which means that people save money. Yeah. I mean, it's it's really interesting. I mean, the knock-on effect of services like Snoop actually could be pretty dramatic from a, a, a big incumbent bank organization because, as, as you know, probably way better than I do, you know, universal banking cross sell upsell you know some products don't make the the revenue and the broad pool of actually the 2.3 2.4 uh, products that a customer you want them to hold um actually when each individual line has to be profitable because actually the manufacturing of the products and the distribution of the products are different and managed by different organizations i mean the implications for banking could be very very significant if this if this scales out but but a very good one right um you know both from a the revenue and the business model but also within big banks the the operational cost that has actually required uh, you know uni economics to get down to a very good level uh, to run each of those products so i mean this this could start um I uh, said recently, you know, evolutions people don't see very often, but revolutions people notice pretty quickly. If uh, if you suddenly start distributing lots of products through this, through through Snoop, then actually the impact on big incumbent banks could be really significant. Yes, and, and hopefully not just banks. You know, I wouldn't want people to go away with the view that this is just about financial services because this is about spending across everything, if you know what I mean. So, for example... As you're talking, David, I was thinking one of the things that we've discussed is, you know, if we get a, a very significant take up for Snoop, we'll have the sort of people power, if you like, to go to companies, let's say utility companies as an example, and say, you know what, we, we think, um, you know, we've got a million customers here who really want to have cheaper, I don't know, electricity or something. Can you do us a special deal? And that starts to create a pricing dynamic, I hope, within different industries. That means that always uh, organizations are going to be looking for the best consumer deal 
rather than necessarily the best deal for them. And, and that, as you say, I hope will be a revolution that could really push things forward. I mean, one of the ways in which we're thinking about Snoop is as the next generation price comparison site. I think that the um, price comparison sites have done really well in this, you know, in this way. They've held organizations to account, people like Martin Lewis and Compare the Market, Money Supermarket, are showing us all where we can get better deals. What we're doing, though, you know, for, for, the, for all of those organizations that have done a lot, so much good, as consumers, we have to work out, um, you know, does this advice affect me? And if so, what am I going to do about it? And the difference with Snoop is we'll be able to say to you, this is something that absolutely affects you personally. We're not going to talk to you about anything that doesn't. And by the by, when we've identified that it affects you personally and you're interested, we will make something happen for you that automatically gives you that benefit. So, you know, it's personalized and automated um, next generation price comparison, really. And as you say, I, I hope that that will change pricing dynamics across a whole range of industries in the consumer's benefit. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, uh, I think we're just hitting uh, hitting our time, and I, and I know you're uh, with, the, with the thousand things that you do every day. I'm sure there's uh, something you, you're probably three minutes late for now, so uh, I better let you go. But thank you so much for joining us, Jane Ann. Um, where can people find out more about about you and connect with you, but also uh, Snoop as well? Where what's the what's the website? Um, come to Snoop and um, Snoop dot app, and come to Jane Ann at Snoop dot app, and uh, I'd be delighted to hear from anyone and everyone, please. Please Fantastic. sign up well, and tell your friends. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it's a great product. I'll um, for anybody uh, who uh, wants to catch that, I'll stick it up on my LinkedIn, stick it up on my Twitter uh, after the show, so you can kind of jump on it. Great to see innovation happening in Norwich. I mean, uh, definitely, uh, if we can keep that going, that's a, a great thing from from my perspective as well. All right, guys, that's all we have for you today. Unfortunately, uh, what we're going to be doing if you come back same time tomorrow, I've got Eric Wilson, who's the CEO of Australian fintech Zinja. We're going to be talking about everything that they're being up, up to down under. Really big raise that they've just had as well. So really, I'm trying to understand what it is that they're doing down there. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe and see you tomorrow. Thank you.